Hello, welcome to the Weave online user group. Hopefully you can hear and see me. My name is Tama Onakahara. I run the developer experience team here at Weaveworks. And today, um, it's great to see a lot of people joining and a lot of familiar faces as well. Some of whom we've actually seen in person. when We've done uh, various workshops in different cities. So it's great to see people we know. So thanks for joining. We are very fortunate today to have uh, two really exciting topics covered by two very expert people. Um, one will be on COPS and Kubernetes oper operations. Um, and then another will be around um, some Kubernetes topics, which include Kube ADM. Uh, so the first speaker is Chris Love, who I'm sure you all know. And um, the second is Lucas Kallstrom who um, um, they're both deeply embedded in the Kubernetes communities. Um, and um, Lucas himself works with us as um, kind of part-time as part of our developer experience team here at WeaveWorks. So it's great to have a good group of people. And um, with that, let's check to see if Chris loves camera and audio work. Everybody see my screen all right? Yes, we can. Excellent. Appreciate everybody joining us today. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Chris Love. I am one of the top level owners of the COPS project. Very active with that, as well as uh, one of the SIG leads with Kubernetes, with SIG AWS, which is a special interest group for running Kubernetes on AWS Cloud. And let's see if I can actually get to my next slide. There we go. So COPS, what is COPS? COPS is Kubernetes uh, operations. Our tagline, it's the easiest way to get a production grade Kubernetes cluster up and running. Uh, we like to think of COPS as kube colorful clusters. So, you know, it's full life cycle, create, delete, update, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're top level Kubernetes project, have been for a while. Um, got the URL there, you guys can investigate. Uh, we automate the provisioning of Kubernetes clusters in AWS and GCE uh, at this point. And GCE is actually new for uh, COPS 1.8. We take an approach where we automate the provisioning. What I mean by that is the infrastructure, so your EC2 instances, your GC instances, uh, the networking, the firewall rules, everything. Uh, we deploy highly available control plane HA masters, which means um, you can have three or more in quorum. HA masters. Uh, we support full rolling updates uh, as well as upgrades. Had hundreds of uh, production grade production clusters uh, go through this update process, so it's very mature. Something that's very unique is we support YAML based API configurations. You have daemon sets, you have deployments in Kubernetes, so everybody here is probably uh, very familiar at, at YAML, uh, with YAML. We take the same API objects and we have an API model and we're able to create clusters based on those templates. Uh, building on that, we have templating and dry run modes for creating manifests. Uh, we've net support out of the box, of course, and many, many more features. We like to think of COPS as DevOps for Kubernetes. And what we mean by that is DevOps is a repeatable, testable process. So you have a manifest, you create a cluster. Manifest is stored in a source of truth. You, uh, you can use COPS as a CLI, straight CLI as well, much like KubeCuddle. You give the same exact options, you, sh you have the same exact cluster created every time. Uh, on top of that, every end-to-end -end test that we have within the Kubernetes project, it, the top level Kubernetes, Kubernetes project, an AWS cluster is created with COPS, it's a blocking uh, test that this test has to pass on the current version on the PR that's being pushed into Kubernetes. So we're trying to pro provide a very hardened production grade tool that you can use. So COPS 1.8 is not out yet. You're like, well, Kubernetes 1.8 is out. Well, we run behind the release schedule of Kubernetes typically by about a month uh, in trying to ensure a really a uh, strong product for you guys to use. We have beta support for Google Compute Engine uh, in 1.8. Another new feature is manifest and templating 
and dry runs modes for that. Of course, we have Kubernetes 1.8 support. Many, many more features. Uh, community within COPS is really outstanding. We have uh, the release list is incredibly long for this release. Very, lots of exciting stuff. Question, why would I want to use COPS versus AWS ECS? Well, that's a ECS versus Kubernetes question. Um, so the question really is, why would, would you use ECS or would you use Kubernetes? So that's, that's really the base question. Uh, COPS is a tool for Kubernetes on top of AWS. And also, AWS is going to be teaching uh, AWS Cloud or creation of Kubernetes the AWS Cloud, both at their conference coming up, um, big AWS conference, I'm, I'm zoning on it, as well as KubeCon. As I mentioned, COPS at, uh, it's in beta currently. Release is pending. Uh, we've had a few updates going this weekend. Just a couple different tweaking PRs. So COPS and Google Cloud, really exciting. Uh, we've got, uh, and you're noticing, we support specific platforms. So we support Google Cloud, AWS, and we have vSphere in alpha support. We have work on DigitalOcean as well as work on OpenStack. Uh, for this release, we're releasing Google Cloud. It's been, uh, support's been around uh, for a while, or the support for Google Cloud's been around. And we've uh, gotten the end-to-end -end testing with GCE almost at 100% passing green. And really that's what we, when we move a cloud into beta support, it has to be testing, testing within the Kubernetes, Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, a quick question, um, CloudFormation and Terraform. COPS does export to Terraform and we have alpha grade CloudFormation support. Uh, so if you're a Terraform shop, you can export, uh, use COPS to create your Terraform templates and run directly on that. We've got a lot of users that use that. All good questions. So cluster creation can be done through, another question is about GKE. So Google Container Engine, which is the hosted managed solution versus GCE. So GCE is where, like GKE is a great product, don't get me wrong. If you've got 30 basic microservices, you're not doing anything special, run on GKE, outstanding product. The, with GCE, say you're running, uh, one of their clients is running Cassandra stateful sets that are 32 gig heaps. Um, you need to be able to tweak things. You need to be able to uh, set uh, horizontal pod auto scaling. If you need to tweak something in GKE, you really can't. You get what you get. If you need uh, more dynamic installation than COPS is a product you can use. So this, these are the really basic steps uh, for creating a cluster. You, can, you need to either use DNS or use gossip. You've got to create a bucket uh, in storage for your state store. You export your state store. These are all command line commands. Um, you export the feature flag, which is alpha allow GCE, and you run one command, which is COPS create cluster with your pro Google project, your zone set. You're done. You've got a cluster starting. Let me switch over to my command line and I'm gonna create a couple clusters and answer a couple questions as well. All right, let me get out of this. So is COPS 1.8 production ready? Um, until it's released as GA, I'm gonna say no. Um, like I said, we've got a couple things going in. We recently actually fixed the weave template so that CPU is tweaked. Um, lots of testing going in. All right. That should be sharing. Everybody see my command line here? Yes, we can. Excellent. So you see lots of history. I've already set up the project name. I already set up the environment variables. And I'm going to run the correct command. Got some debugging out to. This really is boring. 
Um, and frankly, cluster creation should be incredibly boring. We handle the certs for you, which is one of the things, and actually, if I remember correctly, we're using Kube ADM code for that. Now we've exported the kube config for you. Cluster spinning up. It takes about five minutes typically for a cluster to spin up. Uh, we have SSH access set for you. We also have created uh, DNS entries. Everything's getting created. I'm also going to start my AWS cluster at the same time over here. I'm going to use a little bit different command, which I'll be going over later, but I want this cluster to be up and running. So I'll go over exactly what I've, I've done here. But I just want the clusters creating the background so we don't have to wait on them. go back to my presentation to get that command. And I've executed three commands. I mentioned that we have full manifest support. So I've created a cluster with the manifest. I'm actually creating this one in AWS. I created a secret, which is your uh, SSH key, and then I updated the cluster. It's a three-step process with YAML. It's a, it can be a one-step process with, uh, with GCE. Let me do this. You see that better now on the screen share? It's pretty small. <laughs> well, then let's make it bigger. Better? Better, but yes. let's do that. All right, excellent. We're actually going to switch back to the the clusters or crate in the background. I'm actually going to slip switch back to my presentation if I can find that. So clusters are going on their merry way. We've actually created a full VPC for AWS. All kinds of good stuff. Now, as I mentioned, we have full YAML manifest uh, support. And what that means is that you've got your deployments that you deploy, you've got your daemon sets, you also now have a cluster YAML, as well as a, a instance group YAML, which is a group of uh, nodes for both masters as well as clusters. You're defining and customizing, say I need to um, run on AWS, you want to use uh, large P4s for machine rendering and you need all the configurations to use uh, the NVIDIA cards. Completely supported in COPS. Couple command lines to set up Kublet. Um, you can actually configure the EC2 node uh, with a, a, a container that's run right away. Everything is accessible uh, within the API. So with that, the manifest and dry run templating, one of the things with deployments is that's kind of not trivial is, uh, my sound's gone? I can hear you. So okay. Maybe All right, excellent. Yes, I'll show you the man YAML in a moment. Um, so one of the things that's kind of frustrating with deployments is I've got to create a deployment every time. Well, what we've done is we've created a dry run mode 
in COPS that you feed the command line switches and you generate a template out of the box. And let me switch back to my command, my CLI here. And let me make it huge so everybody can see it this time. So as I mentioned, there's a dry run mode. And what this does is it takes whichever CLI options, there's about 20 CLI options on it, and it creates you a YAML manifest out of the box. Oh, let me of course that cluster already exists, so we have to run a new cluster. There we go. So you can see the YAML is very familiar. Uh, you've got metadata on it, you have a spec, very familiar, you just don't have pods in here. Now with this YAML manifest, what you can do is you can go in and take the manifest and now add Golang templating to it. So great, I've got a manifest, but I've got to create a manifest for every cluster. Well, now you don't. You can parameterize, uh, it's Sprig, um, Sprig Golang templating. You can fully parameterize what options you need to template, and then you can dynamically generate the manifest from that template. So I'm gonna do that right now. So you have your cluster template, right? And with the template, then you gotta build a values file. So here's my values file. I've got the cluster name. I'm gonna run uh, spot instances on AWS and I'm gonna run it in uh, US East one. So you can see the name is going to be replaced, the region is going to be replaced, and see if I can type here. On your instance group, the max price is going to be replaced. So you can run functions, uh, it's full sprig te templating support, so you can do a lot of cool stuff with this. I'm excited to see what people start doing with this. So from here, we've got the template, we've got the values, hit enter, there you go, there's a fully um, created template that you have, uh, you can create a cluster with now. This is actually the template that I created the cluster with uh, in AWS. So let's go and see if our clusters are up. So as I mentioned, this is a full CRUD, create, update, delete support for clusters. We also have a validate mode, which validates a Kubernetes cluster. I need to give it the name. So what this has done is it's gone out to, G to Google, um, the API that we set up on this, on this server. It's said, okay, how many masters, how many nodes are up? Great, let's validate that. All right, let's validate that everything in Kube system is running, uh, including Kube DNS, Weave, et cetera, et cetera, and then go from there. As I mentioned, it's full CRUD support, so let's get rid of this one. One command, and we're deleting the firewall rules, we're deleting the instance group manager, the instance template, everything that we've created for you including some disks on etcd.
over in this window, we have the AWS environment variable set up. So let's validate this cluster. If I can type. So we've got a full cluster up and running with, uh, with uh, EC2 spot instances, which makes it really affordable, running about four cents an hour on these right now. And we've got a full cluster up and running here. Now, kubectl, of course, uh, we want to get my system pods. So when COPS creates a cluster, oh, that doesn't help. When COPS creates a cluster, we export the kubectl config for you. Here's our friends uh, Weave running on the cluster. And it also provides capability for managing your admin level kubectl configs. Um, and it provides, if you have access to the state store, which you can control with AWS IAM or GCE IAM, you have access to your kube config. Such things as RBAC supported, um, multiple different configurations and tweaks you're able to put in. Um, hooks, and, and as well as a new feature uh, that's going GA in COPS 1.8. You're able to run a container really easily and quickly. Let me stop, let me delete this cluster. So to summarize real quickly, and I know that it's been, a, I think I'm getting pretty close to my time here, and I want to take some questions as well. Uh, COPS, really we want to focus on, on DevOps within uh, installation process, which is a repeatable process. Whether you use the CLI or you use uh, YAML, fully supported, but we want to give you a repeatable process that's been tested. Uh, tested with Weave. Weave actually maintains the manifest that's built into COPS. So this is one command uh, that you're running. COPS creates um, your, your VPC in AWS. It creates your secrets, creates your subnets, creates your EC2 instances, uh, or, you know, your autoscale groups, installs Kubernetes, as well as installs Weave for you. We install the base packages of Kubernetes, which are kubedns, as well as uh, CNI provider that you select. On top of that, you have full instance group management support. And what instance group is, it relays back to either uh, Google uh, managed templates or an auto scale group in AWS. So you're able to group nodes. Say you have data nodes and you have uh, uh, CPU intensive nodes. You're able to create two different instance groups for each of those and break them up. So uh, we do, there was a question about Autoscaler. Um, and we do integrate, or Autoscaler takes over after COPS. So the min and max aren't switched automatically with COPS. Uh, we unsegment ourselves and uh, allow the Autoscaler to take over. Now we read back in that information. So if you're going to adjust the instance group, you're not going to mess with Autoscaler. Um, by default, COPS does create a cluster with three nodes. Um, we can create three masters as well in HA. Um, you want to use a region that has three uh, uh, availability zones, and that'll create a group of three masters. Now, what you can do is you can take the instance group templates that I showed you, and you can define whatever sizing you want. Uh, say I need 60 nodes of P4 2XLs. You can do that. Uh, any other questions about COPS and installation?
Sorry if I missed this, but did you answer the question about Route 53? I did not. You need a Route 53 managed DNS to create the cluster in AWS. You, there's two options within AWS, actually three. Uh, you can have a Route 53 managed either internal or external domain. Uh, those are two options. And then the third is to use gossip, which is a .info domain and uh, uh, kas.info. Um, question was, is there anybody uh, running this in production successfully? Uh, yeah, small companies like GitHub. Um, they use, I think they're a Terraform shop and they base this, uh, they use COPS. Uh, we've got a lot of lot big companies that run it. Um, I've got customers myself. Um, one of the largest banks in Australia is using COPS in production. Um, some really exciting stuff. Um, and not only that, uh, there is uh, people that have upgraded clusters. They've gone from 1.4 to 1.5 to 1.6 to 1.7 uh, successfully with a production cluster. Um, not doing greenfield clusters at all. They're, they're maintaining the same cluster. So not only are we running in production, but we have successful upgrades in production. Uh, additional documentation is uh, under our docs folder. We're, um, within 1.8, we want to push it up to the Kubernetes site. We've got a lot of great tutorials, um, full CLI documentation, DNS, instance groups, security groups, GCE tutorial. It's all uh, the link to the docs folder uh, is within Kubernetes slash hops docs. Is ops tool you can use at once or set up, or are you supposed to run ops tools at different times of life cycle? Yes. It is, think of it as kubectl. So it is a full cluster life cycle management. And what I mean is you create, you update, you uh, modify instance groups, you create a new instance group, you do a rolling update, you do a validate, all of that's driven from cops. Um, the, uh, the, thought process for the future is that COPS will be running as a controller within the, the cluster itself. My end goal, which is a lofty goal, is to have a Kubernetes cluster upgrade itself. Uh, upgrading is new instant EC2 instances. What about etcd? etcds run on the masters. Um, we've got issues in to support etcd offloading to external nodes. Uh, upgrade, we uh, try to keep our um, Infrastructure is mutable as possible, and what that means is you have an instance group, you change, you update the EC2 instance type, you run a rolling update, and it swaps out your instances for you. We also maintain an EC2 Debian instance within the project, so you're able to get the correct kernel, um, correct Docker's already installed, et cetera, et cetera. What if I lose a node and it's a master one? Well. Um, etcd is stored on, your, on an EBS volume, so you've got EBS or GCE volume, so you've got the persistence there, and the SLA on that's really high. We have componentry within, uh, within COPS, which brings back up your master, mounts your volume for, for etcd, starts etcd over again. So we've had master level failures, and um, it's pretty seamless. If you're running three nodes, it gives you definitely a higher level of HA. Um, but, you know, I, we, if you don't need five nines for your control plane, make it simple, just run a single master, etcd's persistent on volume, you're good to go. Rolling update. Uh, node goes down at one at a time, HA capability for cluster uptime. So rolling update, uh, so there's a couple things. We've got some improvements coming in a rolling update, which is going to make um, some different patterns make it a lot better. Right now we're taking down a single node and then the auto scale group comes up and replaces it. And here's the kicker. Kubernetes is already HA. Now you have to make sure that your applications are HA so that doesn't impact the application service. Um, really it's trivial to make Kubernetes HA because it's built that way. It's not trivial to make your applications HA. So if you lose your master temporarily, um, so your workers won't be reachable? No, your workers are, your nodes are always reachable within, uh, especially when you use Weave actually, within in Kubernetes infrastructure if you lose a master. What you lose is jobs and you lose capability to modify the pods that are already running. 
Um, do we need Terraform with cops? No, uh, I don't use Terraform at all personally, and my clients don't use it much. Uh, but we have a, it's, if you're a Terraform shop already, it reduces the level of entry for you. Ingress rules, how is this managed by cops? So cops' job is to get your cluster up and going. Ingress rule, and we manage uh, an elastic load balancer for your API if you want that. Other than that, you get your own ingress rules up and running. Now, you're able to tweak security group rules specifically in AWS as well as GCE so that you can set up your own ingress rules uh, correctly. Was COPS validate actually do? These are all great questions. COPS validate um, validates that you have a running cluster. So what that means is you're going to have uh, instance group for, for masters. We check that that's up and running. You have instance groups for all your nodes. You, we check that all those nodes are up and running, that the correct number are up and running. You now have pods typically within Coop system are critical pods. Those pods have to be running, like uh, etcd, <laughs> for instance, uh, API server, Kube DNS, Weave, they gotta be up and running. We check and validate that those pods are up and running. And what this impacts on a rolling update is that we check that the node has been deleted and then the node comes back up and we validate that, your, that the, the node has upgraded successfully by starting Weave, by restarting, et cetera, et cetera. Do you need an ALB in AWS to manage ingress rules. ALB is one option. There is also Nginx controllers they can do for in in Nginx as well as you can just use the load balancer service. Do we have a release date for 1.8? I knew this was coming. Um, we are in, we just released the second beta. We do not have a hard release date. Um, goals probably a couple weeks. Uh, we've got reInvent coming up with AWS, so we promised AWS they'll have 1.8 1 for, for that. What other questions am I missing? Yes, so just wanted to remind people, um, or if you came in later, um, please make sure to choose all panelists and all attendees, or um, to everyone when you're posting your questions in the chat. And I know so many were scrolling and I was just trying to make sure that everybody could see them. So if we did miss your question, please post it again. If you have a question for further clarification, please let us know. But uh, yes, I think Chris did a pretty good job at keeping one eyeball straight where, <laughs> straight away and one eyeball to the side. Um, Personal opinion, COPS or Kube ADM? She, uh, I'm one of the owners of COPS. Lucas is next. <laughs> Give Lucas, Lucas a chance. Lucas is the owner of Kube ADM. Yeah, yeah, I'll, Kube I'll ADM, talk to you. Use some of the internals of Kube ADM and I know it's on the roadmap to make Kube ADM uh, more uh, uh, pluggable um, and break up the functionality so that cops can reuse more of the componentry of it. Yeah, I'll, I'll touch on that later, but they are not direct competitors. They are two different projects with different scopes. Yep. Does cops have a API similar to the CLI? Yes. Everything that is mirrored in the CLI is in the API and more. Uh, for instance, you want to change uh, uh, API server audit log size. Gee, we're not going to provide that in the CLI. Uh, but you export the CLI to your YAML, update that, you're gold. So we, um, you mentioned an existing node. It's great. Then, then Kube ADM is your product. Um, we have uh, support for... Uh, different, the major different operating systems, CoreOS, RHEL, CentOS, Debian, um, Ubuntu. So, yes. excellent. Great. I think I'm about at my time here, unless yes. we got any other questions. And um, so real quickly, I'll, I'll include a pitch. Uh, we're actually partners with Weave. Um, so if you guys have any needs for helping out with uh, Kubernetes, let us know. Um, as well as uh, my blog is chriscnm.com. Uh, just put up a new posting on CNI providers uh, this weekend. Uh, I'll actually be taking this presentation and putting it into a blog post as well. And feel free to reach out on uh, COPS channel. We've got a really vibrant community for support, as well as uh, I'm Chris Love CNM. You can ping me on Slack as well. Excellent. I really appreciate the questions. Thank you so much. Yes. Guys. And we even had someone in the chat uh, share a link. So 
Um, so while we're switching over, so yes, if you came in later, so that was Chris Love. Um, we have great Kubernetes um, contributors and community members, and we're really lucky to have them speak here. So next is Lucas, who is um, both a friend and a partner, just like Chris and Love is, but he um, part-time is sometimes a WeWorks contractor. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Hopefully everybody else can as well. Great. Okay. Hi, I'm Lukas Chelström from Finland. I've been a member of the community for quite some time now and have done some different things. For example, been a Kubernetes maintainer for a couple, for, for some time and been speaking at KubeCon, Kubernetes certified administrator, things like that. Right now I'm driving a company that's performing uh, part-time contracting for WeWorks, which is really exciting. And yeah, I'm in school, <laughs> uh, in upper secondary school uh, by day. And what is KubeNM? So it's a tool for bootstrapping a best practice Kubernetes cluster easily uh, on existing infrastructure. And it set up, sets up a minimum viable cluster. No extra bells and whistles here, because it's meant to be a unification effort in the community to reuse and share code in one common core. That's KubeADM that, uh, that has the, the things that all clusters need, all Kubernetes clusters need, regardless of where you're running and things like that. And we want the user experience to be really great for new users. Uh, hence, we have like, well, KubeADM in it to initialize the cluster and keep the cluster secure, of course. And as I said, the, the KubeNM scope is not the same as COPS. Uh, I'll show a diagram of that later. Uh, instead, KubeNM is meant to be a building block for COPS and high level tools that manage the whole cluster's, li cluster's life cycle. But KubeNM's task is, task is to unify and, and keep the, the common functionality of clusters in the same place eventually. So yeah, already provisioned nodes and machines. And we do have a swappable architecture uh, where we divide everything in the cluster creation process into a thing we call a phase, a, an, an atomic task basically. Um, setting up or favoring one specific CNI provider or network or building things into KubeADM to like support KubeADM in it dash dash networking weave is out of scope because of the, because of the layering uh, of Kubernetes core uh, projects. So we can't include a third party solution inside of uh, KubeADM. We can't hard code in anything there. But instead, fortunately, it's just a kubectl apply command away, which I'll show you later. So you basically have to run two commands, kubedm init, and then apply your network provider of choice. And we work great there, of course. Um, the intended audience for kubedm is people who want to build their first clusters, maybe, on bare metal. I mean, uh, I'm known in the community as the Raspberry Pi or ARM guy. So besides me here, I have a Raspberry Pi cluster running KubeADM on them. Um, it's, it's kind of fun <laughs> and, and works great. So you, you can take KubeADM and basically bootstrap clusters anywhere um, and, and works great. If you're new to the community, want to test out and see how Kubernetes really works before maybe using COPS to, to create your whatever uh, clusters in AWS, for example. And it's, it's also at the same time intended to be used and consumed by COPS that is higher level than KubeADM. And as we develop KubeADM, we make in SIG cluster lifecycle a special inter interest group for uh, managing and simplifying the, the lifecycle of, of Kubernetes clusters in general and keeping an eye on how we can do things better in the community, how we can make it easier to bootstrap your own clusters. So as part of the KubeNM effort, we, we, we're trying to make Kubernetes generally uh, easier to install. So yeah, 
first of all, in this uh, diagram, we have some kind of infrastructure. It can be a public cloud, as shown here, or it can be your Raspberry Pi stack sitting on your desk. Um, so hence, the parenthesis is there. You, you basically have to have some nodes, whether they are running on, in a public, private, hybrid, whatever cloud, or on, on, in your office. So let, let's start with, uh, we have master uh, and some nodes. Then we run kubeadm on all of these, uh, all of these nodes, and kubeadm minutes for masters and kubeadm join for node nodes. Then we get the Kubernetes API, which is great, and we can do a lot of things with that. And then uh, one of the efforts of C cluster lifecycle is to create an add-ons API in Kubernetes. Uh, this is work in progress and hasn't, uh, isn't done yet, but we're aiming to, to make a new unification effort here as well on the like, third tier. Um, if, if we think, think that infrastructure is layer one, Kubernetes or Kubernetes bootstrapping is layer two, then we have add-ons as the, layer, the, as the third layer. Um, so this is yet to be done, but will be a great, great effort, and you could have great impact to contribute here as well, just as a general hook. <laughs> um, basically, right now we have different, different uh, add-on managers in the community. COPS has one, GCE has one, and Stackpoint Cloud has one, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we don't have one in core, which we need to have uh, in, in that, that's, uh, described why we need to have that is described in other documents that are fairly long uh, to read, but are worth reading. Uh, so why, uh, what is the difference between QBDM and COPS? Uh, we kind of touched a little bit, bit on this earlier. Uh, so you see QBDM here in the middle running on each node and, and basically creating and talking to the Kubernetes API. So that's QBDM. Kubernetes place in the ecosystem, and that is Kubernetes scope. COPS, on the other hand, is uh, responsible for managing the whole cluster and knows about all the things, all your machines, all your masters, all your nodes, load balances, cloud providers, your monitoring, networking, logging, and, and all that. So this is why these projects are not direct competitors. Instead, they complement each other. OK, so how do I spin up a cluster with kubedm then? Uh, well, first I install kubedm. It can be done via packages, uh, as described here. Uh, for example, we basically provide some dev packages so it's easy, <coughs> easy to consume for you. Once you have it, it's just a kubedm in it away. And this will do everything that's needed for, for creating a Kubernetes cluster. Then you should install your networking provider. As said, this is not in scope for kubedm to, to favor any specific, specific solution or anything. You just apply that later. And then you install kubedm on your nodes and basically provide, so on kubedm init, when that process is done, you're gonna get a token, um, which you then, should give to the kubedm join command to say that, hey, I'm auth authorized to join this cluster. Um, so that was kind of part one uh, of this short talk. Uh, um, this is actually a longer talk, but I had to cut it down a bit, a bit to, uh, to be able to present in this uh, other half of the meetup. Um, but yeah, so part one, kubedm, why does it exist, etc. Uh, two, how does the Kubernetes components actually work together? And what do they do? How does Kubernetes make this abstraction, this great, great abstraction for your applications? Well, uh, at, at the very core, we have the API server, which is basically a REST API stateless web service that then uh, talks via gRPC 
to etcd, the, the single source of truth key value database we have, which can, of course, be clustered. Um, and the API server can be put in uh, behind a load balancer as well to, to achieve AJ. Then we have the controller manager, which reconciles all the time to make sure the desired state of the cluster is the actual state. So if you create a deployment and it notices that, well, you, the user said that the replica should be three, and right now we don't have any pods running on these, the controller manager makes sure that the pods are created, which is a scheduler then binds each pod to, to a node of choice. Um, OK, so then we have some nodes. Um, we have hardware, some OS, container runtime. Uh, the container runtime is actually swappable, thanks to the recent efforts of CRI in the community. So you can have Docker here. You can have Rocket. You can have Containerd. You can have CRIO or whatever other project that implement the CRI interface, common runtime interface, uh, cont container runtime interface for Kubernetes. And the kubelet is a node agent that's running on every node. Uh, and this is Kubernetes specific, fetching information from the API server. What pod should I run? And then we have networking. Here is Weave in this layer, and it's third party. So we uh, contain a network interface. The kubelet talks to Weave and tells it what, what uh, IP tables rules to create, and et cetera. Um, and a sequence diagram you can look into later is basically what happens when you create a deployment. Um, first, you tell the API server, I want a new deployment. That's persisted into etcd. The controller manager notices that, oh, I should, a new deployment was created. I should create a replica set. Uh, and a rep from a replica set, then pods are created. And the scheduler then binds uh, the, the unbound pods to nodes, and li like this. Uh, eventually, the kubelet on each, class, on each node is going to realize that, hey, I should run this pod that the user said uh, I should do. And it's the, it tells CRI, which could be Docker, Containerd, whatever, to run the pod. and well, eventually, all your workloads are running in the cluster. And yeah, so that was like a quick part through, really a uh, quick demo, uh, a really quick intro to how Kubernetes achieves this abstraction. Uh, lastly, how does the community work in Kubernetes? So we have a lot of uh, special interest groups. I'm mostly active in this cluster lifecycle one also driving QBADM adoption, and active in the cloud provider refactoring workgroup. And basically, Kubernetes is such a huge project, so nobody can really tackle everything. Uh, instead, we focus on, on specific tasks and do them well. And Chris is uh, also active in the uh, AWS SIG. Um, we have different cloud SIGs here. Um, and SIGs often, ha often have regular meetings, weekly or biweekly, whatever, and talk about things, uh, own code, own projects, and make sure they are as good as they can be at any given time. And lastly, uh, we have some quite interesting stats about the Kubernetes project, it's huge velocity in the latest years. Although it's it's really young, it's a young project. Um, so I really recommend that you contribute to this project. It's it's a great learning experience and exciting to be on board. Uh, and the com community is really friendly as well. And well, here we have some links. Uh, that you might be interested in. I could share this deck later if folks are interested.
that should be it to my the minutes I had. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lucas. Um, so yeah, we just have just a few minutes left. Um, and yes, some people had asked, um, Lucas not only will share these slides, but he's had, um, we were looking earlier, he's had a previous version of these slides on Google Docs, and there are like numerous people all sharing and, and looking at them. So it seems like they're having their own life of their own. So um, real quick, do you want to go through the chat? There are a few questions that we had before we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Let me see. Uh, uh, yeah, I will definitely share them. Where is the best place to share them? Later um, or? Well, everyone uh, in this group will get uh, an email. So at that time, we'll decide where the best place is and, um, and we'll be able to access them. Um, so cool. quick one. Assume after custom Kubernetes, uh, this might be in the context of something you're saying, but assume after custom Kubernetes clusters set up using these tools, uh, can you add Istio on top afterwards? I think that's the question. Yeah, so, so you can basically add anything that can be run on Kubernetes can be run on Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we recently also, uh, well, the, the con Kubernetes conformance uh, program was recently announced, some, was it yesterday even? Uh, and there are a lot of different vendors have certified their, their solutions and the Kubernetes installers and Kubernetes is among that list uh, and makes it, it sets guarantees that you can move your workloads and run the same workloads kind of anywhere that passes this conformance suit. Okay. Um, there is an do, you need, Go ahead. Uh, do you need root access to set up Kubernetes? Yes, because, uh, well, basically, if you're, the kubelet is then going to have root access to your machine and can do any, anything, so hence you also need to grant Kubernetes access to modify your machine. Um, anything else? Yeah, there is an early one. Um, it says, in your diagram, is protobuf referring to protobuf proto encoded messages over HTTP? Yes. OK, great. And that's for scale. Uh, protobuf is used for scalability reasons. So we could hit the 5,000 node uh, scale target earlier this year. Excellent. So I hopefully captured the earlier questions. Now there's some newer ones. What do you see as the biggest negatives of running Kubernetes on ARM? Uh, I don't think, well, of course you have to, you, you, you might have to port your applications as well to ARM, right? If you want to run them there. Kubernetes uh, run it smoothly. Uh, and we made sure that it works, it works well there. Uh, but yeah, I don't see any huge blockers or negative sides, but you have to be committed to make sure all your applications are working in ARM indeed. Okay, excellent. We do have a few more questions, but we are out of time. So what I'm gonna do, so let me just share our final screen here. You can see that. So yes. Um, we will be sharing um, an email with you with these links. So I see that there are other questions here. We'd love to continue the conversation, uh, Lucas especially. So if you could join our community Slack page, um, we are on Slack, and this is a link to add yourself to the community Slack so we can answer. <laughs> I'm just seeing more and more questions come in, so that's really excellent. And also, as um, Lucas mentioned earlier, this is actually a longer presentation. This is a part that he wanted to share for here. And uh, we will be sharing the longer presentation in the spring. So um, stay, make sure that you are part of this Weave user group so that you can join us online or we might even do some of the events in person. So thank you so much again to Chris and thank you so much to Lucas and we will be tracking all of your questions so we'll make sure to follow up. So thank you to all of you for attending and um, joining in the conversation and asking so many great, great questions. So thank you again. Um, we'll see you uh, at the next Weave user group in two weeks. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.